We're living right now in a very important moment of time where artificial intelligence is participatingly highly active, not only in our regular lives, in our families, in our social events, but also in education. And the question is, where is this borderline where we recognize the attributes and the benefits versus the drawbacks of artificial intelligence? This is the Hacker's Corner. Hi everybody, welcome back to the Hacker's Corner. My name is Christian Servin. I'm a professor of computer science and information technology, including cybersecurity and artificial intelligence here at El Paso Community College. I'm very happy to see you all in this new show. Uh, remember that we're running this series of artificial intelligence. And in a matter of fact, we're running two things in parallel, not only the AI aspect that will influence our society nowadays, but also we're running the adversarial thinking aspect of that. That is in collaboration with the Hack the Border. Hack the Border was an event that was created since last year in 2022, but it will continue working in regular basis through providing professional development, such as hackathon, also uh, known as cyber, uh, cybersecurity competitions, but also coaching and professional development workshops. Uh, we're gonna give you more details about Hack the Border. The idea of Hack the Border is to provide professional development, but also to recognize awareness, what is happening in cybersecurity, in AI, and in a lot of different emerging computing areas that we're living in right now. So today we have a great show. We have a show that we'll talk about how to integrate AI components, not only in society, but also in education. And of course, we're in El Paso Community College. We're in an educational institution. So we're a little bit concerned about how can we process these concepts of AI contemporary issues. And I'm very, very happy to have right now two guests. In this size I have. Emiliano. And in this size I have. Ivan. And both of them are computer science students here at El Paso Community College. As a matter of fact, let me just clarify. Both of them are ethical hackers. They're hackers, as I already mentioned previously in other events, in other shows, that we are responsible to not only train the future hackers in computing, but we necessarily pay a lot of attention to create the ethical hackers that will make the changes, the influence of this technology for the, for the good in society. And that's basically what we're trying to do here, uh, not only to show these tools to society, but also to make this awareness. How can we use them properly, responsibly, and ethically? And I'm very, very happy to have uh, Emiliano and Ivan. Uh, both of them are STS students, and if you were wondering what is STS, is the Student Technology Services. We have, we're very lucky to have this program in El Paso Community College where students can go there and uh, regular students and can also apply for a job here in the college while they're doing their studies. And this is a great opportunity to improve your marketable skills and develop across the entire district. So in case you're interested, if you're watching this and you're a student at EPCC or you would like to go to EPCC and not only study, but also get some experience, gain some experience, apply to SDS. We'll talk about, about SDS a little bit later. So let's come back here and let's start this conversation that we have with Ivan and Emiliano. Welcome to the Hacker's Corner. Thank you. Thank you. How Thank are you? Good, good in yourself. Good. Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm just here <laughs> in the Hacker's Corner. So tell us a little bit, what is AI? And you, I know, I understand, uh, you're peer leaders. You work for the computer science department in IT. So tell us a little, bit the, a little bit the work that you do and how AI is being taking place in the classroom. Well, artificial intelligence, widely known as AI, refers to the simulation of human intellect in software and computers. And actually, AI has been implemented since 1940s, so since the very first computer was created. Today, we would like to talk about a specific AI, which is ChatGPT. Before we move to ChatGPT, we would like to go over some of the AI subsets that are out there. So AI could be broken down into different subsets. These are machine learning, 
deep learning, and generative AI. And then we have large language models, LLMs. And this is our main interest today, actually, because ChatGPT fits into the LLM classification. But to understand LLMs, we must understand first what machine learning is. So machine learning is a classical discipline of AI concentrates on algorithms and models that allow computers to learn from data and then make predictions and take actions. Think, for instance, on Grammarly or your phone autocomplete. These algorithms learn from experience, from the data, and then make predictions. What will be the next word in your message? Or how could you improve your composition in your writing? Then we move to the deep learning. And deep learning is especially a branch of machine learning that focuses on algorithms that mimic the human brain performance by using a technology known as artificial neural networks. And these algorithms have the capacity to recognize images and audio. Uh, they're often used in the automobile industry for these self-driving cars like Teslas. So these cars use deep learning to recognize a stop sign or a red light or a pedestrian. Then we enter into the revolutionary AI of our days, which is Gen AI. And Gen AI are models that are capable of create new content, such as text, video, audio, images, and even more. Actually, LLMs are a type of Gen AI. And these LLMs, these models, uh, are specifically designed for natural language processing tasks. What this means? This means that these models can understand and generate text. OK. Um, this is great. As a matter of fact, I'm in a different size of the different part of the communication. So let me go to that diagram. Okay. Oh. This LLMs, what does that stand for? Large? Language models. Okay, so this is great because the large language models has been created for all these past decades, right? Yeah. We, the past decades, all humans, we've been using technology and add them all by chats, by Word documents, emails, things like that. So everything has been stored in what they call large language. I like this diagram that you mentioned here and this hierarchy, because this is where we're going to pay attention. Give us an example of LLMs. Well, ChatGPT will be a perfect ex example, since ChatGPT is a chatbot language model developed by OpenAI. And it's part of the generative pre-trained transformer series of models designed to generate human-like text based on the input it receives. What's so special about ChatGPT is its communication abilities since users can interact with the machine or the software throughout prompts. Okay, we're in education. So how is this related to education? Well, we believe that ChatGPT could be incorporated into education since it provides a personalized explanations to the students. It provides feedback and answer to their questions, and it helps them to understand in any concept. So think, for example, in a student that needs more time for understand a particular subject, but the professor doesn't have enough time, right? Well, ChatGPT can help this student outside of the classroom. Why not? It is 24-7 available, and it's an open resource. And we also believe that it could be used for instructors to generate new class materials. This is very interesting because you've been dealing with students, and not only just students, computer science students, who've been probably potentially using ChatGPT. But what you're saying is that this may be helpful. Yeah. Can you tell us how? Well, Emiliano and myself serve as peer leaders for computer science um, courses. But before we continue, we would like to emphasize that peer leaders are students that want to help other students improve their programming skills. And having said this, um, we as peer leaders have integrated ChatGPT into our peer leading sessions <clears throat> by simulating our work or training it since we provide some examples of our previous work that has already been done by us, by us so that ChatGPT can be able to replicate it. Yeah, so what we can see right here is a couple of code, right? We're computer programmers, computer scientists, so we deal with work. And this is what you're referring that there's already a large, extensive uh, amount of data that relates to this stuff. Right, so this table is partially created by ChatGPT since we provided a very similar table to it 
That way, it could be able to mimic our table. Okay. Yo, so this is very impressive. And, and something that we have discussed in other episodes, remember that we have a visit from Professor Kranovich from UTEP and other guests. They have told us about the benefits about having this in terms of education, how this can also not only help in order to improve the programming skills or any kind of skills, but also to give you a good starting point when you want to deal with a machine. Suppose that you just want to start from scratch. This is a great tool, but also we need to use it a little bit responsibly. Now, how can we actually train this machine? Can someone tell me about this thing? Yeah, sure. Well, the only way to interact with ChatGPT is through prompts. And a good prompt will give you what you really want from ChatGPT. So that's what we meant by training it. We interact with ChatGPT with prompts. So what you're seeing right now on screen is a general formula to compose better and more productive prompts. So this formula is composed of, well, the first component is context. So context could be an explanation of what you're currently doing. So you tell to ChatGPT, hey, uh, right now I'm learning about programming, or uh, I'm, right now I'm doing a lab for my physics class. Or it can also be the role that you want ChatGPT to take. I want you to act as an history instructor. I want you to act as an uh, art instructor, right? Then we need an instruction. The instruction is a task or a specific instruction uh, that we want the model to perform. Then we have the input that is just the entry or the, uh, the question that we're interested in answering. And then we finally need the output. And the output will be just the format in which we want uh, the response. So here on screen, you're seeing an example. So the context will be, OK, I want you to act like a history instructor. The instruction, compare and contrast. The input, the consequences for America of World War I and World War II. And the output, I want you to format the response, the comparisons, in a table. This is a great example. Can you hear me from here? Because now I'm here in the chat GPT and I can see this whole part of how everything has been structured. So this is what we call is this is a training, right? You have the training based on this formula? Yes. It's not a, you don't need to uh, follow this formula strictly, but it, it is a good starting point. So why is it important to train the machine? Well, you need to uh, instruct the machine to do the things that you want to do. You need to be it's, it's like when you have a conversation, Some, something, sometimes you're not that much explicit. You need to be explicit to get uh, the output that you want. I like that because when we have a conversation with some specific demographic of people, we need to understand their context. It's very hard to basically start talking about computer science and it's not it's impossible in front of someone who is probably trying to understand things on philosophy or social sciences or natural sciences. Now, if I talk about biology with this context, it makes more sense if I'm going to go talk about people with anatomy or things like that. So this is the training piece. And the training piece is very important because we delegate that thing to the machine. And the machine will start recognizing how you actually will interact with them and it will focus in those specific content. So we have here a couple of tomorrow and beyond. Can someone tell me a little bit more about that? We have four ideas for best practices in case we're thinking of incorporating ChatGPT in a classroom. So these are, first, we need to understand the AI capabilities. So we believe that we must instruct the students about the capabilities and limitations of using AI. Then we need to emphasize the original thought. We need to emphasize the significance of employing ChatGPT or AI for research or uh, brainstorming rather than a replacement for original work. We also have to cite AI assistance. So if a student uses content created by AI, they must give credit to it, just as they do for other sources. And finally, we need to teach responsibly AI usage. So we suggest that you organize some training sessions where you teach students how to use AI ethically. Let me just go back to the presentation. So what you just told us is, is very important because right now everybody is using not because they want it. It's because it's very easy to use 
one of these tools. ChatGPT, by the way, is only one of those AI tools. There's other things like Copilot, which is probably the, the apocalypse for most of the computer scientists because all the codes is generated by then. The best code, by the way. Um, Dell E, which actually generates all these great images. And we have talked about that thing, but you can even, images that they doesn't exist, AI will generate it for you. And other ones, including music generators, presentation generators, and you call it. There's, you can see right here in the screen that there are several, several of those applications. Now, the fact is that it is here to stay. And we will embrace them, but we would need to work with them responsibly. And also, we need to think about how ethically we can have those impacts in society based on these new changes. There's anything else that you would like to add for the conversation that you have had? Right. So um, we believe that using ChatGPT might have some consequences. So in retrospective, the consequences of having such a tool like ChatGPT are that we transition from being writers to being editors. Since it takes a command, generates an output, then we become sculptors in the sense that we modify certain words and arrange them to better suit for we want the output to be, saving ourselves time. But as I pen down these thoughts, I believe that you can write if you didn't read. That's why it's important to embrace new upcoming technology and adjust it to our needs instead of our wants. And having mentioned that ChatGPT is a tool, we often tend to compare ChatGPT to the wheel because how many tasks were not made easier when the wheel was invented? We took advantage of it and incorporated it into our lives. And where I would like to get by saying this is that students will independently use ChatGPT, especially now that it's becoming more popular. That's why it's better to teach them how to use it correctly, but more importantly, in an efficient manner, since technological development possesses an exponential growth. Therefore, it is critical and or crucial that we all are familiarized with it. Esther, I agree. Is there anything else you would like to add? Well, we know that the students will use it, right? So we must instruct the students how to use it. Okay, if, if they're gonna use it, it's our responsibility as educators, I, I include ourselves uh, in that. We must instruct the students how to use it correctly because it has too much advantages. I agree too. And, and we're very lucky to have peer leaders like you are that decide to go to the next moment of time where you can actually visualize how can incorporate these best practices into the computing. So this diagram for me is very important because that kind of summarizes all the effect, all the history of AI that has been happening for the past for the past years or months as a matter of fact. Like for example, you mentioned Grammarly. Can someone tell me Grammarly? Because all of us we use Grammarly. I use it every day. And the majority of my uh, faculty colleagues will agree with me that we encourage the students to use Grammarly. Grammarly is what? Grammarly is going to be a software that's going to predict your next word. Again, it's based on training just as ChatGPT. Since Grammarly basically what it does is that it gathers all the words or all the information from a database in order for it to predict your next word. So very similar to an autocomplete, no? Because I remember when, when the autocomplete just barely started in the, on those um, mobile devices, I only, write, I only type one word and it tells me what the other word was going to be. Is that what you're referring to? Right. So how does that work? Well, basically, uh, that's more basic than Grammarly. That is just a, it, it's the same. It makes predictions, but it's based on the most words that you use <laughs> when you're messaging, right? So if you, I don't know, maybe you say hi, uh, always in the same way, <laughs> and it will keep the record of that. So the next time that you start a message, that will be the first suggested word. Okay, do you agree? agree. And, and for those who don't know, Grammarly is a application that helps us to construct very nice narrative uh, from letters, uh, essays, and things like that but it gives you the correction in case there's a typo or there's something else that you probably don't know. It will give us a suggestion according to the highest probability that that will happen. Now, 
we have talked about probabilities there and there, but not necessarily about how can we use probabilities because every time we dis discuss about probabilities, we see all these weird symbols and it's like, oh, MG, why do I need to learn these things? Well, all the AI is based on probabilities because what you mentioned, predictions. Now, the other subset that you can see here is deep learning. And in the past, we talk about deep fakes, um, other different applications that they change the voice, they change the, the, the face recognition as well. Is that deep fake? Well, yeah, deep fake comes from deep learning. Actually, the term deep comes from the idea that this deep learning algorithms simulates the human brain performance. So in our brain, we have a lot, millions of neurons, right? But this brilliant minds of computer science created was an algorithm that clustered artificial neurons. So that way, it, well, it can be used for a lot of things, but mostly it is used to uh, recognize images. So for example, uh, one of these algorithms can distinguish between a dog and a cat. So we have seen this in different episodes about when we were training the, the machine. And I'm very happy that you brought the neurons because that is the way the human brain works. And if you remember in this episode that we have here, we discuss about how we can, there were, there's a lot of different images that they have muffins, right? There's some muffins here, or not muffins, I'm sorry, uh, different dogs, and then we put some muffins in order to make the machine confuse. And when you see a, a muffin or a cookie like this ones, it gives you this weird thing. So sometimes when you show a dog like this kind that we see here, it gives you this weird representation what is a muffin, is a cookie, or is a dog, okay? So that's part of the how um, we can actually recognize when something has been not necessarily trained correctly. And for me, that's very, very important because what you mentioned is that if we train the machine, we train it with good things. But what is good things? And it can be through either having a good well writing or a good, good programming or a good facts on history. So if we train this machine incorrectly, if we train these machines by using bad data, it will train badly. Is that what I'm hearing? That's correct. So basically how um, this software works is that it recollects all data from its developer, but it also uses data from the users. So let's ask ourselves this. What if a user trains in a bad way a software such as ChatGPT, what would happen? So we have to take the, all these possibilities and take into consideration before using this tool such as ChatGPT. Okay, so fair enough. So what I would think um, your instructors, for example, because right now there is a concern, let me just put it, put it mild, right? There's, there's a concern about how students will be using this. And, and I know you already been talking about this thing, but any suggestion or recommendations? We, they need to start talking about it in the classroom. That is important. They need, the students need to know that the instructor knows about this technology, okay? So you don't fool your instructors, but they need to start talking about it. That way it will have the students feel more comfortable when using these technologies because they know that the instructors know how it works. So I, I wouldn't feel that comfortable doing plagiarism if I know that an instructor knows what ChatGPT is, right? He will recognize it immediately. I agree. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, thank you everybody for watching and I would like to see you all either in the YouTube channel from EPCC TV and please follow us. And also, don't forget to send us an email in case you have questions, um, any kind of suggestions that you have, or suggestions for other episodes. Remember that we're running this series for adversarial thinking for the, for the border good, along with the AI um, impacts in society. My name is Christian Servin, and I hope to see you next time. Happy coding, everyone. See you next time.